Fire grants from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the A.J. Fletcher Foundation, Raleigh, North Carolina, making a difference in the arts, education, and broadcasting. By the Mobile Corporation, L. John Polite, Jr., the Friends of Firing Line, and by the financial support of viewers like you. <laughs> From Raleigh, North Carolina, welcome to Firing Line. I'm Michael Kinsley of the New Republic magazine. One big surprise of the Persian Gulf crisis is that most of the opposition to President Bush's tough stance has come from the right, not from the left. Oh, most conservatives are on board. Mr. Buckley's own National Review is energetically fanning the flames. The Wall Street Journal has urged Bush to, quote, take Baghdad and establish a MacArthur Regency. But Several leading conservatives have expressed doubts about the enterprise and positive horror of any escalation into outright warfare. Phrases that haven't been heard since Vietnam are suddenly tumbling from the strangest lips. Quagmire, world's policeman, even come home America. The split on the right predates August 2nd. For the past year, ever since the collapse of communism became indisputable, conservatives have been debating America's role in the post-Cold War world. Some are enthusiastic drumbeaters for what President Bush calls the, quote, new world order, with America energetically exploiting its role as the only remaining superpower. Others argue that with communism defeated, America can now withdraw in triumph. As many have noted, this seemingly new position is actually a return to the traditional conservative isolationism of before, before World War II. One conservative commentator has even revived the magic words, America first. Mr. Buckley's guests are two conservative con controversialists. Joe Sobran is senior editor of the National Review, syndicated columnist, and a broadcast commentator. He's writing a book on Shakespeare, and he is also the co-chairman, I believe, of a group called the Committee to Avert a Mideast Holocaust. Giles Lambertson is editorial director of Capital Broadcasting and a former newspaper columnist here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mr. Buckley, the new right-wing anti-militarism may not be as anomalous as it seems at first. Joe Sobrand points out in one of his columns that wars usually lead to a stronger centralized government. The real anomaly, in a way, has been the conservatives all these years who have been stress strenuously opposing big government in all its manifestations, except for the very biggest, which is the military establishment. Well, I, I can't um, claim to make a distinction that Adam Smith didn't honor 200 years ago which is that it is the uh, role of the state uh, occasionally to uh, bear arms and cause its citizens to, uh, to bear arms. Uh, so I don't think it's unorthodox. The, the question really has to do with uh, whether the United States um, is, is all, all of a sudden developing imperialist uh, uh, habits and is, going and, is, and is heading back towards Wilsonianism. I see no evidence of that. Uh, my friend Joe Sobern uh, does. Would you give us an example? I mean, other than the Middle East, or do you want to confine it to the Middle East? Well, the uh, uh, I was a little alarmed by the uh, Panama operation last December, Bill, be, because it seemed to me that we didn't have a serious single rationale for that. A lot of different reasons were given for that, including uh, the uh, the war on drugs. Now that the arrest of Noriega hasn't materially affected the uh, presence of drugs in America, for example. I don't know what our rationale is here. I've heard so many given. Uh, some of them, like I think Mr. Sapphire's, are just hysterical when he talks about a holocaust of Americans later, or Saddam Hussein wiping us out in the future if we don't stop him now. Well, I can't think wipe, can... he, he's talking about the hostages, isn't he? Which I, I... <clears throat> you, you don't uh, assume that um, Hussein is incapable of executing 4,000 foreigners, do you? Well, no, I don't think so, but I don't think he has any particular motive to do it. He's taken those for protection. This is a little different. I'm not going to defend him, of all people, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to make a distinction between taking hostages for the purpose of insulting, debasing, and threatening them the way the uh, Iranians did 11 years ago, and taking them simply as a protective measure the way Saddam Hussein does. He wants to uh, deter us from attacking him, that's all. He didn't take them on a lark or anything. 
Well, he wa he wants, uh, as I understand it, uh, and tell me if if, if you understand it differently. Um, he is using, if we are correctly informed for the first time in modern warfare, uh, foreigners who have diplomatic immunity and is simply planting them in such a way as to give him the kind of protection that he seeks again in, uh, in, a, in military action. Is, is that your understanding of it? Yes, and that's an interesting strategy. I don't think that's a central part of, of, the, uh, of the Bush policy to go over there, though. I, obviously, uh, uh, the, the, the invasion overran some territory, none of which is uh, a, a natural resource of great importance. Oil, a four-letter word. Um, unfortunately, it's also a necessity, uh, no matter how many letters are in that word. Um, he destabilized the region in a region that can't stand a lot of more uh, of, of instability. Um, he, uh, a nation with which we have a spatial uh, relationship uh, is threatened. And of course, there's a moral code that says that aggression um, shouldn't be rewarded. And for those sound reasons, uh, we're over there. And I think that the president's made his case, uh, and those who criticize him haven't made theirs. Uh, well, um, I, I read uh, as recently as a couple of weeks ago that uh, there have been 200 military actions by the United States since 19, since uh, 1776, only and only four declarations of war. So it is true that we have engaged in uh, a, a tremendous number of Panamanian type operations. By the way, I have to agree with you. I think there was no particular justification for going to Panama. Uh, it would be much better. It could have been done. Uh, better at another time. However, there was a justification for going into the Dominican Republic and then going into uh, Grenada in my judgment. But I've always been guided, as, I, as you may tire of hearing, by the Fulbright principle. He said 15 or 20 years ago, the United States government has no proper quarrel with the internal policies of any government in the world, no matter how obnoxious they are, as long as it doesn't seek to export them. So we didn't go in after pa Papa Doc on the western half of Hispaniola, but we did go into the eastern half because it looked as though there might be another Castro white salient there uh, in a global situation. In, in, uh, in the Persian Gulf, I understand that oil is critical to uh, the healthy economy of the industrial democracies. Now, I'd have been in favor of taking action much, much earlier, like in 1973 because I interpreted the cartel as engaged, OPEC, as engaged in making economic war against the United States and against uh, others. We bought 410 million barrels of oil from Saudi Arabia alone last year. Now, if we had paid not $18, but $60, which would be the equivalent cost of 1979 or $45, well, we're running to very close to $100 billion. I don't see why we should let people do that to us, do you? Well, there are a lot of other kinds of action that, that we could take, I suppose, but the, the question is whether we're going to send American boys there to die. And that seems to me the crucial distinction between that, be, between uh, one kind of action and another here. I don't see that we have a vital interest at stake. Yes, we have interests all over the world, we always do, innumerable interests. But to, to speak loosely of our vital interests in the region is, well, to speak loosely, I, I can't remember at any time in human history when a state hasn't considered as a vital interest that which is a key to its economic uh, life. Well, uh, we, uh, it's uh, not every, every war I can think of uh, in the last 500 years has had substantially uh, uh, an imperialist and an economic motive. But Bill, we've already driven the price of oil higher than it would have been if we'd simply let Saddam Hussein take Kuwait. It's already up around forty dollars a barrel. The Saudis are talking about it going to a hundred dollars a barrel. I don't think anyone thinks that would have gone that uh, Saddam Hussein would have had the power to set it at that kind of Who's talking about a hundred dollars a barrel? In, in the first place, we well, can we can we can supplant the oil that we're not now getting from Kuwait and from Iraq by running up to seven and a half million from five million. What Saudis can do, and they can do that tomorrow, plus Nigeria, Mexico, uh, and Venezuela. So why, why should we be on our soil? Well, I'm telling you the figure that was thrown out today in Time and Newsweek by uh, one of the one of the Saudi uh, uh, what are they? What are they? They're sheiks there, as, as opposed to emirs and sultans, I guess. At any rate, I don't believe blackmailers. That's a, <coughs> a bunch of blackmailers. Well, I <coughs> I don't buy that figure either. I'm just saying that the the uh, the, the 
the price we're now paying is a lot higher than it would have been if we'd simply done nothing. Well, but uh, we, we're only two months into this, and if uh, two or three months from now we have uh, proved our point conclusively, we can do two things. A, we can save uh, uh, ourselves from the result of a Kuwait-dominated, uh, from an Iraqi-dominated uh, Persian Gulf, uh, and we can make a deal with Saudi Arabia that would last into the next century to keep oil down to the free market price. Is there any objection to that? No, and I think if you're speculating about the price of oil, if you want to speculate, you can uh, speculate what would have happened if we hadn't, if the president hadn't gone ahead and acted when he did and as quickly as he did. W would we be better off today if he had hesitated than if he had gone ahead? I think we'd, be, I can't imagine uh, being a better off uh, in a situation than we are today. If uh, he would have hesitated and sent uh, troops and they probably would have been parachuted in and, uh, and, and hit and started firing. And so, uh, no, I think that uh, we have every incentive to be in there. Self-interests, uh, corresponding self-interests around the world are national interests, and we, we, should have, we should have acted as it is. Well, you know, I'm no expert on oil prices, but the Wall Street Journal, which is extremely hawkish on this, did uh, run a piece by David Henderson, our old friend, who uh, argued that uh, Saddam Hussein really can't hurt us much in the oil department. It, at most, he could drive up uh, the uh, uh, cost of living, I think he said, uh, half of 1% for Americans. That was, his, that was his estimate. The journal sort of uh, well, flew this without realizing the implications for their own position. 1% would be $500 million. Half of 1% would be uh, uh, um, $250 million. We've already figured out the possibility of hitting $100 billion uh, from Saudi Arabia alone. Now, if you throw in all the other Persian Gulf states, plus also, what's it going to do to people who, because they now have to spend three, four, five times as much on oil, can't therefore buy American products? What are going to be the uh, domino effects on American uh, industry? Uh, what what uh, Henderson said was, is there's a hell of more oil in the world right now than there was in 1980, which is true, 50% more. But it's also true that whereas we were exporting, we were importing 41 uh, percent uh, uh, 10 years ago, we're now importing 50 percent. So our dependence has grown on this foreign oil. And the idea that this, this guy should control 45 percent of the oil uh, of the entire world, in my judgment, uh, is something we have a vital interest not to permit. Incidentally, why do you use the word hysteria so often when you talk about us people? What's, what's hysterical about it? Well, mm -hmm. maybe I was retaliating for the word isolationist about us. I mean, uh, we're talking about getting, getting back to normal uh, in, in the world. We don't call Bolivia and Peru isolationists because they don't send troops all over the world all the time. You can interact with the rest of the world without uh, shooting. A friend of mine says if you, if you uh, would rather trade with foreigners than shoot them, you're an isolationist. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the, word, the word isolationist is really used in two contexts, uh, one geopolitical and another moral. Uh, I think what uh, Fulbright said is uh, uh, makes him guilty of being called, if you want to use the word guilty, a moral isolationist, i.e., no matter what they do to people in Haiti, I'm not going to send the Marines there. And I think he's right, because we don't have enough Marines, and, and we, don't, we, don't have, uh, uh, we don't have the morale of, uh, of, uh, of an army on the march, to use Albert A. Knox's phrase. But a geopolitical isolationist is somebody who doesn't reason adequately into the necessary interests of this country. Uh, at age 15, I was an isolationist, but I was quite convinced at age 15, I think I was right, that there wasn't anything happening in Europe that could actually destroy or hurt Detroit or, or Middletown, New Jersey. But that isn't true any longer. Uh, even in Iraq, uh, they have uh, uh, missiles now there that can reach Great Britain. Not with a nuclear payload right now, but with a chemical uh, 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 payload. Now, that being the case, we can't afford geopolitical isolation, can we? Well, um, I'm not arguing for isolationism. I'm arguing for dealing with any kind of threat that I see. And I don't see a threat to us from Saddam Hussein. He wants to sell us the oil, not to hit us with nuclear weapons. I mean, we get, you get a kind of argument here that implies that he wants... What did he, he took, want, what did he want from Iran? That he, well, he, he ultimately, I don't know, but we were supporting him there. Well, 750,000 people were killed, boys died, mm -hmm. to use right. your, the vocabulary right. you cling to. Well, I'll, I'll cling to it there, too. I mean, he, he's, uh, 
He's a bad man. We supported him. Well, we if he's a bad man with war. nuclear energy, why might not he be bad in our direction? Can't he face West in addition to facing East? Well, does he want the oil for the ultimate purpose of destroying the oil-consuming world, Bill? Yeah. I, he wants to tyrannize over uh, the world on, on as large a horizon as possible. Presumably, he doesn't want a Wagnerian ending, a Gardamering in which... Uh, uh, but, but I can't see anybody would. If Hitler could have predicted where he would end up in a bunker, he obviously would have done something else. I, I should think so. Well, I think Saddam Hussein, however mad he may be, to use another word that's thrown around a lot, uh, understands he can't conquer Mars and he can't take the U.S., and I don't even think he was intent on taking Saudi Arabia. Well, he can't take the U.S. right now, but what, 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 five years from now, he, he might have a nuclear artillery uh, or, or even strategic weapons. Bill, if, may I use the word hysteria? I mean, I think that's hysterical to think that he would want to do that. Why there, would there, he want there, to? What would his motive be? Well, there are six, there are six countries besides the usual ones that already have nuclear power. Yeah. And uh, we went into high gear for a non-proliferation treaty. Now, it seems to me... It, 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 it makes sense for us, to the extent that we can, to see to it that odd nations don't get nuclear weapons, doesn't mm. you? Yes, yeah. within limits. And, and well, um, what limits? The, the Israel simply bombed them five years ago. Yeah. Thank God they bombed them five years ago, because now they don't have nuclear weapons. Right. But, they, they, but the predictions were they would have it by now. Yeah, uh, but uh, why suppose they'd be directed at us? We have a f uh, immeasurably larger nuclear arsenal than he could dream of having. He's got a country of 17 million people, far more vulnerable to us than we would be to him. That's what I mean. If you could say, look, if, if, if it were just the oil, or if, if the arguments for stopping the guy were uh, confined to one reason, then I could take them seriously. It's when I get this proliferation of mutually contradictory reasons that I get very skeptical. What is the one reason that you would uh, well, I mean, justify? Well, pick one, pick one. I mean, I, I, you know, we hear it's the oil. What's contradictory? Huh? What's mutually contradictory? Well, I, as I say, why would he want to destroy the market for the oil he just stole? Why, why, why uh, oh, presumably, if he set himself up to sell oil yeah. uh, at an extortionist price and you refuse to pay it uh, and say, well, what's more, I'm going to see that I get the stuff at lesser price, he then can say, oh, no, you don't, because i got a nuclear weapon. And that's, that's simply escalation. That's not mutually contradictory, is it? Well, I, I, that scenario seems too improbable to me to wage our lives on it. Well, but all kinds of improbable scenarios has festooned the history of the century. Well, then, What's then, more then improbable than Stalin or everywhere, Hitler? All the time in that case, Bill. I mean, the, 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 there is no limit to what you no. can fantasize about the future. No, there, there, no there's, there's no limit to uh, the uh, evil effects of the old ostrich in the in the media. Uh, something should have been done about Hitler earlier than it was. Lots of people were killed. 55 million people were killed in World War II. We should have prevented it, right? Uh, now, if Hussein is allowed to develop a nuclear uh, uh, arsenal, it seems to me that he is of a temperament that uh, simply casts aside normal humane considerations, as he did uh, in Iran, as Tem the Soviet Union repeated. His, his temperament is, is a part of it. He understands power. He is. Uh, he used his power to build himself up as a savior in his own country and in the Arab world. Uh, <clears throat> and, and if we uh, manage to get him out of Kuwait and get him home again and nothing else, he'll consolidate the power and do it again. I think that he is a threat. We're dwelling on the economic parts of it, but what about the, the idea of destabilizing that region and having us drawn into a, a larger war? How about the idea of, of our word uh, as a power being good and... and uh, uh, countries such as Saudi Arabia are, uh, are there that we, we don't respond. Isn't, aren't those, uh, don't those have uh, adverse effects uh, for this nation down the road? Well, you, you know, it just seems to be, an, to me, an unmeasured response. Well, this guy in an eight-year war could only take a 50-mile strip of Iran with a lot of outside help. He doesn't seem to me to be anything like a Hitler, much less a threat to us. Well, maybe he didn't have enough poison weapons and he ran out of Kurds to kill. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the Washington Post, by the way, reported that those Kurds were killed by Iranian cyanide gas. Now, I don't know. Well, maybe they had lunch with the Iraqi ambassador. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're, they we're talking about unreason. Why, why, why is it that they want to take Kuwait and then proceed to destroy it? You are aware of what's happening in Kuwait. Yeah, but... Uh, the genocide is a pretty good word for what's happening there. Well, uh, now, are we... Again, is it... Is this... 
moral isolationism? I mean, it, do we just go get him because he's so bad, or no, do we no, get him because no, no. he poses a threat no, to us? Because he poses a threat to us. Uh, uh, the, uh, the very fact that we did nothing uh, about him during the last eight years, uh, except make friends with him, mm -hmm. and we're, we're capable of making friends with uh, you know, dear old Joe, uh, mm -hmm. as Harry Truman called Joe Stalin. Uh, so we're, we're perfectly capable of being amoral in these situations. We loved Mao Zedong, did we not, in 1972, even though he was in the middle of a cultural revolution from which 275,000 people uh, were victims. So uh, I'm not saying America has a clean history here. No, no. But there, there was something that ignited this, made it distinctive, yeah. uh, and that was this, this threat to simply say to all the industrial powers of the world, you are through growing economically because we're going to charge you 60 or 70 dollars a barrel for oil, and that simply puts a quietus on economic progress. Well, I think he, I think he took a, a signal from us, misconstrued it, Mrs. What's her name, Murphy. Uh, of the State Department who said we had no particular interest in uh, inter-Arab disputes. And I think he took that as the signal that we didn't mind if he took Kuwait. That uh, was a mistake on his part. But it was also a sign that he, he was interested in how we were going to react. I mean, it's not the act of a man who was simply absolutely defiant of the U.S. I think well, he does respect power. If you, if, if, does he? Yes. So why doesn't yes. he retreat from Kuwait? Well, because, well he has, because he doesn't respect power. No, no. Well, because, because he's not acting reasonably. All the things that you mounted your arguments on, you're having to withdraw. No, 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 no. no. I don't. I, I, look, I, I, I agree that he's a rapacious man. I, I don't dispute that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's guided by other considerations, too. I mean, he doesn't want to lose face. He doesn't want to lose all that oil. He wants to, uh, he doesn't want to lose his head, uh, too. So he's got to think of all those things. Now, I don't, I, I I, again, I don't want to make excuses for him, but at the same time, you, you have to define the evil, not, not, not just uh, denounce it. And I think he's a specific evil, but not an evil that threatens us. Well, I, I, I don't understand how you say it's not threatening to um, a country which imports one half of its oil on which the uh, on which uh, the livelihood, let alone the prosperity, of everybody in this room hangs. Uh, if you say, well, why would he want to accept the seller to us? Sure. Mm -hmm. But in the course of science, he could impoverish us. Now, that's a vital interest, isn't it? Yeah, we were importing, what, 5% of our oil from Kuwait and Iraq combined uh, at, the time this, at the time this happened. Now, he'd have to take Saudi Arabia, too, in order to begin to be meet yeah. the kind of threat you're talking about. Yeah. Now, I don't think he had any designs on Saudi Arabia. I mean, we had to send Secretary Cheney over there to talk the Saudis into letting us, quote, rescue them, and they imposed very stringent uh, conditions on us for doing so. They didn't welcome this. They, they didn't dial 911 and say, please, please, come save us. Mm -hmm. they, they, they obviously didn't feel that they were in danger. There was an old territorial dispute there between Iraq and Kuwait, and it makes sense on its own terms. Uh, they got a lot of tribal problems, so you yeah. know, we're, we're familiar with. Uh, uh, they, uh, they certainly aren't very bright tacticians, it seems to be plain. Uh, they would have, uh, now, now, now they want about $20 billion worth of uh, heavy stuff from us because it's sort of more alert to this particular threat. But uh, the, the fact that they haven't been very wise strategists, I don't think ought to deter us from recognizing a vital interest of our own, right? And the fact that they invited us in finally, and every other country in the world is doing it. it doesn't doesn't that influence you at all? Well, somewhat, yes, but not to the extent of wanting to expose uh, uh, American troops to war. I don't think we have a debate. I I, I don't think that uh, you made your point. Uh, simply, uh, the idealistic stand of the is if it's not tied to action, it, it, it's sterile. And I think that you're making an intellectually sterile point here. Why, what would justify us going over there? You haven't said yet. Well, Nothing would uh, justify uh, intervention? Or? I, you see, I, I look at it the other way around. I think the burden of proof is on anyone who proposes war far away from our shores, and I don't hear a good justification for it. What do you know that everyone else doesn't, because uh, a majority of people in the country and, and nations in the world seem to be supportive of the rationale put forth by well, the president? Well, I'm afraid I, that's going to have to be a rhetorical question. Uh, Mr. Buckley, there is a position that stops well short of the principled isolationism in both of the senses you mentioned, and I think it's actually the position of most Americans, according to polls. It says, it is well worth the crisis, what Saddam did, and the trouble he's causing, 
are well worth the embargo, the arms buildup, all of which have been far from cost-free in any number of ways, but simply not <coughs> worth war. That's a practical judgment, not a moral judgment. And that if war comes, we're going to be scratching our heads and saying, now what was all that about? And in other words, that the ana proper analogy is not to World War II, but to World War I. Now, what's wrong with that? <coughs> well, what's wrong with it, I think, is that um, uh, it's not prescient enough. What would happen if Hussein got off scot-free uh, in terms of um, uh, any hope for stability in the rest of the Arab world? It seems to me that they would seek to punish him for having been uh, unfaithful during a, a fraternal crisis. Uh, what is going to keep him from persevering in his uh, effort to build up a nuclear uh, arsenal? Uh, now, if we can contrive to have him leave and, and, and be powerless without going to war, that's obviously what we ought to do. Uh, war always means failed statecraft. But if, if statecraft cannot achieve that objective, it seems to me that it becomes a military uh, objective which we have to uh, face up to. Are you disagree on that? Well, uh, l let me put it this way in, in, in answer to Giles, too. It's, it, it seems to me it's symptomatic of what's gone wrong here that we... Fifteen seconds. Okay, that we assume that war is the natural response and that the burden of proof is put on people who oppose it. Uh, well, well, I think we will accept the burden of proof, aren't we? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Sovereign, uh, Mr. Lamberton, Mr. Kinsley, ladies and gentlemen. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the A.J. Fletcher Foundation, Raleigh, North Carolina, making a difference in the arts, education, and broadcasting. By the Mobile Corporation, L. John Polite, Jr., the Friends of Firing Line, and by the financial support of viewers like you. This program was produced by Sika, which is solely responsible for its content. For a printed bound transcript of this program, send $3 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Indicate the subject of the program, and please allow three weeks for...